Hello and welcome to the Racing with Rob and Roller podcast March edition. My name is Rob Peters and joining me as always is my co-host Josh Roller, the man who makes this show so great. Uh, we have a, had, had a packed, packed weekend of racing and uh, we are ready to discuss all of it because Josh, I think I left out uh, a few things in the what's in the windshield last week, and I didn't realize it until I was looking at a motorsports calendar and was like, "Oh boy, this is for supercars what uh, races this weekend? We got Formula E coming up as well, which we did talk about, but uh, and I knew about, but uh, even then that caught me by surprise because I had to remember what new channel it was on. So, boy, a lot, a lot of uh, racing this weekend. Were you able to catch all of it, Josh, or did you have to watch most of it on highlights? I watched the Xfinity race, and because uh, I. You know, riding for that one, and I was able to watch the Cup race on Sunday as well. So I was entertained for two races, but I know you watched a few more of them. I did. I watched the uh, uh, Formula E highlights today before the show. Yeah, I, I understand that. That's probably the best way to probably watch some Formula E races is with the highlights. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk about the highlights of this show and uh, all the shows prior i guess on our facebooks and our twitters and our youtubes and everything we're going to talk about all of those highlights uh when we do throwback throwbacks because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we're posting we're posting videos to our youtube channel now from past podcasts maybe stuff that you remember so you can hear much, how much we've grown in the last three seasons and uh you can enjoy it uh as well so um, so remember to follow because i i think it, if it wasn't this past one episode five it was either episode four or five from season one yeah, yeah, I remember you you coined the Montreal screw job too. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and I think I upset a lot of wrestling fans doing that. <laughs> um, I still think I did, but anyway. So uh, if you want to see how much, how many more wrestling fans I can uh, upset, you could just follow me on Twitter at rpeters33 spelled, uh, pretty much not as it sounds because I have two e's in my last time, name. R P E E T E R S three three. Josh is a little bit easier. His is just roller underscore zero one. R O L L E R underscore zero one. And our show is even easier to find at Robin Roller, R O B A N D R O L L E R. Uh, that's even easier to find. So, again, if you're a new uh, listener, we thank you so much for listening. And remember, those are our social media handles. So, uh, with that being said, I think it's time to go ahead and jump right into our first segment of the day, which is Rob's Racing Report. I'm Rob, and I'm going to be taking you on a journey through the most recent news of the week. So uh, starting off again with Formula One, let's go ahead and jump into this. According to the latest financial earnings, this is not good, from Liberty Media, Formula One lost $386 million as a result of COVID-19's impact on the 2020 season. That is a huge uh, number to report a loss for. Uh, but uh, So Stefano Domenicali taking over. He's taking over after a big loss. Whew. I feel like I, I, I hate to be him more. in the boardroom. What's that, Josh? I feel like it could have been a lot worse. I expected it to be a lot worse. I won't lie. So this is actually, to me, when I read that, kind of encouraging <laughs> based off of everything. Oh. So, I mean, I, I expected it to be closer to the one billion mark. Uh, maybe that was just me being over overzealous. I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe. Uh, well, may, I guess I guess if you can let a, a loss like that, I think that's never a bad thing, I guess. Right. Um, more, more, pop, more, uh, more news here. The man who could lose a popularity contest to Jar Jar Binks, Nikita <laughs> Mazepin, is back in the news. This time it's because he's taken responsibility for his actions back in December. In a recent interview with ESPN, Mazepin admits his actions were quote-unquote incorrect, and he takes full responsibility for them. He says he's, quote, much further in his knowledge of on these on this kind of matter than he used to be. Now, time will tell uh, if his reputation will recover from this because uh, already, and, and this is an add-on piece continue, concerning Mazepin because the team he drives for Haas F1 team announced this recently as well, that they're no longer, they've stopped developing work on its yet-to-be-revealed 2021 car, which we knew already because they assumed 2020 would be a wash because of the new regulations that were supposed to be there this year due to COVID they're coming next year. So essentially Haas F1 is, is, is taking another season at the back of the grid already before the yeah. season's already started before they've even revealed their car. Yeah. Uh, and so now you get this on top of this Mazepin actually admitting he was wrong, which is impressive because that is something that I mentioned on Twitter that Santino Ferrucci has yet to do. He has never done and he's never answered for his actions. He's never apologized for them. He's never actually 
admitted he was ever in the wrong or taken responsibility, what have you. doesn't matter. Mazepin has. Mazepin has. So I know... I, I, I don't know if you could look at one to the other and try and say that both are bad, but or one's worse than the other, I should say. Both are bad, but I don't know if you could look at it and say what Ferrucci did is worse than what Mazepin did and has done in the past. I, I don't know. But if Mazepin is sincere about this, um, this is already a good step in the right direction, which is something that we That's wanted true. to see him. We wanted to see him learn from his mistakes. We wanted to see his right. actions have right. consequences. And this seems to be the step in the right direction that it seems like Haas has – at the very least, put something into his head that this was wrong. The way that I read the interview, it made it seem like someone had to, I, and I, I understand I may be giving him too much of the benefit of the doubt here, but the way I read the interview was it seemed like someone came to him and had to explain how his privilege worked almost. And it, it took him, and, and maybe not in necessarily in that in that sense, but it took him a while to really understand, okay, this is why people see me the way that they do because of the actions that I've had. You know, no. this is why, you know, there is a buttload of people say, ha saying hashtag we say no to Mazepin. You know, he's now realizing that stuff that he thought was innocent, which – and to, and to his – again, giving him the benefit of the doubt, if you're a rich oligarch – Son, if you're rich oligarch's son, I doubt that anyone's going to be sitting there from a young age telling you right from wrong. I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not trying to excuse him for it, but I'm trying to say like, okay, I get it. Now finally, someone has sat you down and told you this is wrong. You can't do this. This is why this is wrong. It, it, it could be very possible that nobody ever simply had this conversation with him. At all. Maybe someone did, and I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, and that's wrong. I don't know. But I like to try and see the good in people, even though I still think what he did was disgusting and abhorrently wrong. I'm trying – based on, based upon what I've read in the interview, I'm trying to say, okay, you're not Satan. You're not the Antichrist. You're just a troubled kid who made – who makes stupid mistakes because probably nobody told you not to or nobody – no, nobody made these mistakes and actually face punishment. Like he could have been around people who were grape, groping women for years and never face punishment. And so he does it and thinks there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, and people are, there's men out there that are like that. There, I mean, that's an entire culture that is a serious problem out there. And it could be very well that that was something he was raised on. And now he's having to be shown, okay, this is, this is wrong. You know, this culture that you've been raised in is, is not correct you need to shed this culture and there's people like that who have been in situations like that where they're associated with these cultures and they have time and the ability to g learn and grow from them um i don't want to talk too much about that but that's just how i'm feeling based upon the article that i read uh it, it was a summary I, I haven't found the direct article i read it from a summary from a racer article uh the racer article so but based upon that i'm going to go ahead and say that i hope that he has learned and that he will continue to learn so that hopefully he can be uh, a respected member of the Formula One grid at some point. Because let's be honest, as long as his dad still has money, he's going to be on this grid. Uh, and we're just going to either have to accept it or grin and bear it. I mean, there's really not much else we can do. Most of the community, most of the F1 community has been trying to get this guy canceled for so long. As we've said on this show, we don't believe necessarily in cancel culture. So this is not something that we're going to endorse. I'm not going to endorse it for sure. Uh, but it's just going to be hard for Mazepin to really ever be taken seriously at this point. Um, and time will tell. But, you know, time heals all. Time will tell. Uh, people have redeemed themselves from wars. We'll, we'll see. I mean, he has plenty of time. He's a young kid to redeem himself and learn from his mistakes. So maybe he will. Maybe he won't. I hope he will. But uh, you never know with stuff like this. Um, Moving on to some happier news here, uh, unless, Josh, you want to say anything on that. I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. No, I, I haven't share. read the, uh, the article yet, but, I mean, I, I'll take your your word for it. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully this is a step in the right direction for him uh, and uh, the way people perceive him, and, and hopefully people give him second chances, and, and the 2021 season will be better than what we expected. Hopefully. Um, and here's the happier news here. So uh, some happier news. Williams 
has renewed Jamie Chadwick's contract as a development driver and given her an expanded role on race weekends so that can coincide with the W series. So good news for Jamie Chadwick Definitely. Uh, and her future career. Um, and moving on to WEC news, this is a big, big news that broke over the past weekend, past week, excuse me, it threw everybody into a frenzy in the sports car world. Ferrari will make its return to a factory prototype racing in 2023 with the FIA World Endurance Championships new hypercar class. This announcement comes shortly after it was revealed that Ferrari had officially discontinued its pursuit of becoming an engine supplier for the NTT IndyCar series. That is huge. So uh, LMDH hypercar is really coming around good looking so far. I'm, I'm excited for what the future holds in sports car racing. Yeah. Um, now for some NASCAR news. NASCAR has entered a multi-year agreement with DoorDash, America's leading last mile logistics pro platform. Is that right? Yeah. America's leading last mile logistics platform. I think that's a pretty broad deal. I can, I think there's different ways for that, but obviously it's the leading one when you talk about. That seems very like PR speed. Food altogether, but yeah. Anyway, it says here it will be the quote official on demand delivery platform of NASCAR. The wide ranging agreement will span across the sanctioning body and 11 NASCAR owned facilities. So the only way I'm going to take this seriously is. Uh, in the, let's say COVID's over and you could sit in a race, racetrack again. The only way I'm going to say that this is for real is if you could just go ahead and straight up order DoorDash while you're at, uh, in the stands. Maybe you can DoorDash from the concession stand. Yeah. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like yeah. DoorDash from the sta- concession stand or something. You know, that's the only, I mean, that's, that's a way to, to make that's the money. I mean, every, every, I mean, you got Coke official Soft drink in NASCAR, most, I think all but four tracks that NASCAR Cup Series goes to is Coke, Um, at least last year. IMS is it anymore. Yeah, I know they're Pepsi. Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, it's really uh, weird. I yeah, miss having yeah. uh, Mr. Pibb. I don't know if Road America or Nashville or Coda, what their soft drink partners are, but last year there was only four tracks that were Pepsi. Um, But, like, but I mean, yeah, I, it's tough to integrate every single sponsor. That's the official partner. If you have the place to have a have an agreement, but I would think that at least at the NAS eleven NASCAR owned tracks, you're going to be able to DoorDash a concession stand order. Um, kind of remind kind of reminded me of like uh, back home in in Kokomo, they have the Kokomo Jackrabbits. If you pay enough for this one, if you pay to have this one seat, you can have food delivered to you. Like there are there are uh, concession stand workers, you know, that are essentially waiters and waitresses that come to the the seat and say. Would you like anything to eat at this moment? And and we said, yeah, give bring me two hot dogs and a and a they have Coke there and a Coke. Bring me bring two hot dogs and a Coke right on right right away. And it, that is basically, I think, how this would work. I, obviously, it's kind of yet to be tested because this is new, and I don't know if it would be had time to be implemented for Homestead Miami Speedway. But we'll see if it's implemented at all. At Phoenix, if it gets any coverage on it. I would imagine hey, who knows. Anything's possible. Uh, yeah. Let's go here. Uh, how about this? How about this for some oh. interesting news? During Friday's race hub, Bill Lester announced his intent to return to the racetrack in the Camping World Truck Series race at Atlanta Motor Speedway on March 20th with support from four dealers in the uh, Atlanta area, but is still awaiting a few financial commitments before it becomes a reality. Now, how cool would this be? Imagine Bill Lester returning to the track. Uh, that he made his uh, then Nextel Cup debut in 2006. Yes. And uh, guess who won that race, by the way? Uh, 2006, Atlanta. Uh, uh, probably, you know. was it Casey Kane? You know it was Casey Kane. You, how, how did you ever? I have that race taped because, of course, I have it taped. Uh, you got It's a historic race. Bill Lester made the field, and Casey Kane won. That's all I care. Oh, and it was rain delayed, so it happened between the courses like two days or something. Um. I remember that race very fondly. Yeah, yeah. When, when Casey Kane wins a race, I remember it fondly. Trust me. That, that's fair. I, mean, I feel like I'm usually the same way with 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 Jeff. I mean, how how many did Casey end with? Like seventeen wins. So yeah, there, it, yeah, it's it's a countable number for me. Do you, so, like, do you remember? Actually, look it up. I'm going to officially look it up for you here. Look me. Look it up for me. While you do that, because uh, while I talk about how cool it is that Bill Lester is actually going to be returning to a truck, because yeah, Bill 18. Lester was always. He has 18? 18. Okay, cool. So I was there for his 18th win, too, anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I saw his first, 
and I never forget where I was when I saw his first, uh, and I saw his last. So, and I watched every one in between. So, so I don't know how many Jeff Gordon fans can say that because like most of them weren't even alive during his first win. There was a. I I was I was not alive for his first one, and I was less than twenty four hours old when he won his second one. So yeah, so that's a problem. Uh, thankfully, uh, Casey Kane came around when I was, you know, seven, eight. Perfect yeah. time to latch on to somebody and never let go, <laughs> and and still cry sometimes thinking about it. Um. Anyway, uh, moving on here. Uh, Ty Gibbs will compete in fourteen more Xfinity races in twenty twenty one. Remember, he won at the Daytona Road Course on debut in the Xfinity Series, and now he's getting fourteen more races. Uh, and he, he's going to race at Phoenix. Uh, it, which is going to come up here in a couple of weeks. He's going to come race at Martinsville. He's going to race at Darlington, the throwback weekend, which has been moved to May now. Remember that? Uh, Dover, Charlotte, Mid-Ohio, Pocono, Road America. Now, keep in mind, Kyle Busch is going to be in the 54 at Road America. So he's going to be in a one-off paint scheme in the, in number 81 that I'm definitely going to pick as a feature paint scheme in like two or three seasons, whatever. Uh, sure. <laughs> when we look back on this season or whatever, I'm going to pick that as a featured paint scheme or something. I guarantee it because I love one-offs. Um, he's going to race at Watkins Glen. I'm going to get to see him at Indianapolis. Uh, then he's going to go to Michigan, Richmond, the Roval, and finish at Kansas um, on, on top of any other races he was already scheduled to race. Um, we have more details next year about the Bristol Dirt Race. So not only will the NASCAR Cup Series be practicing for the first ever dirt race at Bristol on Friday, March 26th, Cup Series will also have four heat races that will total 15 laps each in length on Saturday, March 27th, before the 250-lap race on Sunday. So this can be that's going to be uh, interesting. So you're going to practice one day, then you're going to have some heat races, which is essentially going to be qualifying. And then you're, as soon as those heat races finish up, you're going to still wait for a no, whole nother day uh, and then go racing on, on Sunday. So that's going to be interesting. Now, I, I don't know actually specifically, but do you know if the – that's that's still going to be a day race, right? They're not going to move it to the night, are they? I think, yeah, I think it's a day race. Yeah, I'm pretty it sure it wouldn't be that race. stupid, yeah. right? They, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll confirm that, but I'm pretty sure when they announced the start times, it was like you know, a, a, you know, a, a typical um because it's it's usually you know kind of a day race, kind yeah, of cold. Three thirty, three thirty in March. On Fox. Okay, three thirty on Fox. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I'll probably be fine as long as it doesn't like snow or something like it did that one crazy here at Bristol. Um, okay, that's that for the news. So that's Rob's racing report. That means it's time to transfer over to the featured paint scheme, which this week is going to be the 2007 NASCAR Bush Series, the final year that Bush was the sponsor of the second division uh, of NASCAR. Uh, always going to be a uh, Bush Series every once in a while. It was also the first season of ESPN. Broadcasting the full season, yeah. uh, which was met, met with some mixed reviews, I think. People were happy to see it back on ESPN, but ESPN didn't really seem to care. They didn't really throw their best talent at the, <laughs> It's not like to say ESPN had great talent. Bob Jenkins was gone by this time. They really only had from the glory years was Dr. Jerry Punch, and that's who they really had to latch on to. They're like, you guys like nostalgia from seven years ago? The only one that's still working here is Jerry Punch. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I sympathize with them. I really do, because they really tried to make give Rusty Wallace work. God bless him. They tried. They tried to give Rusty work, but who would have known that uh, Rusty would have ended up being the most tolerable of the Wallace brothers in post-retirement. Uh, <laughs> next, I'm serious. Ken, Kenny is a whole different type of animal. I'm not going to get into Kenny, but Mike, dude, Mike, oh. Uh, Bro, that guy. Anyway, um, he drove the number seven Toyota, or was I think it was a Toyota still? Did he drive? Good? I don't know. Maybe, but he had yeah, the Geico car. Jermaine, wasn't it seven Geico Toyota? Yeah, I think it was Jermaine. Uh, and he had those commercials with uh, Lauren Wallace, and he always had the the Geico commercials with this. He always the, Lauren Wallace or whatever he was, or Warren Wallace or someone. I don't know. Um, and he always had that toothpick in his mouth, and he you was always had to try and beat Mike Wallace. You're talking about a commercial that has slipped my mind. Evidently, I'll have to look this one up. You've not seen the I've the Lauren it. Wallace Geico commercials? I'm sure I've seen it, but I can't think of it now. I'm it's oh so my god! I'll, I'll have to look it up later. I won't. I won't look okay, it up. Okay. Well, 
on the show. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to tell us, tell our, tell our glorious listeners here what your featured pain scheme is. And then while I'm giving mine, you're free to go on YouTube and go ahead and look up this commercial. Uh, I'm going to go select the number five Delphi Chevrolet for Hendrick Motorsports, which was driven by Kyle Busch in all its races. It was run because a five car in 07 was, wasn't full time, ran a lot of the races, but it was split between Kyle, Casey Mears, Adrian Fernandez, and Landon Castle even drove a couple races in it too. Good old Landon Castle. Uh, the Didn't Bay- they have uh, Blake Feast, or was that beforehand? That was Arca. That was he. Don't he? He. But he, I was an arc in the ninety four. I don't think he. I don't, he. I don't think he ever made an Xfinity or a Bush start. He for, made a start. I used to call him Blake Feces back in the day because he was so bad. Uh, what did he? Let me see what he did. I'm sorry, that was inappropriate. But it was <laughs> funny. Um, <laughs> the okay. The, the I'll go. I'll talk. Continue on here. The the uh, scheme was base gray or silver with blue swoops along the top uh, of the hood. Two thousand five is when Feast ran. The what? 2005 is when Blake Feast ran. He did run. He did attempt a race oh in 2007, God. but he, he didn't did. qualify. That's right. I forgot he did run some in 05. That's right. So I, I was I, wrong. I By 2007, he was with Sadler Brothers, but he was weirdly either not qualifying or finishing in the top 10 in ARCA. Um, but he could. He didn't qualify in the, in the, in the Bush series. but. Yeah, his uh, one, two, three, four, five, six starts in 2005 were pretty atrocious, given what Kyle Busch had accomplished. Okay. And that's why he got my nickname of Blake Feces. I totally forgot about that. Totally forgot. Um, What was I here? So the the base, the scheme was base, gray, silver, kind of depends on even what the angle was. Um, I, I think it was more of a silver ski or uh, base though. Then you had the blue swoops, like I said, along the top of the hood near the windshield and along the sides of the car on the roof. There are also yellow accents between the gray or silver and the blue. Uh, the best starting position that Kyle had was fifth at the fall Texas race and his best finish was first at Daytona in July. The car is famous for the tremendous crash on lap 28 of the Aaron's 312 where Bush was turned by teammate Casey Mears, who was in the 24 national guard. Chevrolet, which was also a really good looking car. He barrel rolled, um, just just totally destroyed that Chevy Monte Carlo SS all up. Um, this was, I mean, honestly, this was one of my favorite paint schemes of the 2000s. And probably if you were like, the, if you were to give me like a top 25 list of paint schemes in NASCAR, this one might make it for me just because I just, I just like it so much. I like the Delphi sponsorship. I mean, Delphi, prior to this, we'd seen it mainly black, red, and yellow in general. That was what we had seen. So this was very much a, a fresh take on it. Um, and I, I actually I really wish this paint scheme saw a cup cup race, whether it was with Kyle Busch in 07 or with uh, Mark or Casey Mears in 08 or Mark Martin in 09. But I think by then that the, uh, the Delphi had departed as a sponsor. Um, at that capacity at least so I'd, I'd have to go back and review that but uh but yeah love the love the paint scheme a lot um and that's my that that's why i chose it i think that's a good choice i always thought that uh the, the bush cars from hendrick motorsports and, and w- looked really good um, of course i think that 07 was the last season for hendrick's bush program before it became junior motorsports am i correct, correct. in that guy yeah, that's okay. correct that's what I thought. Junior came on all their all their Bush programs were transferred over to, to, to JRM because Hend- Rick Hendrick bought stake in the team. That's why Junior Motorsports. Yeah, and actually, this is going to be an interesting thing. I have you watched? And before I get into my featured paint scheme, I want to ask you this: Have you been able to watch the uh, in depth with Graham Bessinger about Kyle Bush yet? I've watched clips of it. Are you talking about the Rick Hendrick one? Yeah. Yeah, where well, I was specifically talking about how Kyle. It seemed like the major fallout from Kyle and Hendrick stemmed from Ricky Hendrick's death, because yeah. Kyle makes a good point in there where the Bush program essentially fell apart after Ricky Hendrick passed away. I think because well, I, I think he was in charge of driver development, and once that was gone, you got guys like Blake Feese. As you got, you know, basically a, a guy who didn't know how to run a Bush program. And I, I, uh, I think Junior stepping in there was somebody who did know how to run a program like that because he had 
run one with Chance 2 Motorsports for years, and Truex won back-to-back championships in 04, 05, so um, running for Chance 2, so... I think more of it that was just the go-between. I think he made a great point. He was a 18, 19, 20-year-old kid. Oh, trying yeah. To a guy who was 40 years older than him. Um, and even at that point, you know, Jeff was mid-30s. So mm-hmm. you know, his go-between was was Jeff. And and maybe that was – it. With, with, I don't, I, again, I, I don't want to read too much into it. Um, and I don't want to speculate, but maybe just the go between with Ricky was just going to be stronger. And then that, you know, um, that voice, you know, here's my concern, Ricky, can you relay that to, to your dad? Yeah. Um, but I, I totally get that. I totally get that. And, and if that was the reason why this, that relationship between Kyle Bush and and Rick Hendrick and Hendrick winter sports kind of went away, I, I totally understand that, and and I'm surprised I actually didn't think of it before, to be honest. Well, yeah, I mean, and Kyle even mentions in that same interview that the big reason why he was let go was because he had a conversation with Rick Hendrick, with Jeff Gordon, and Jeff didn't relay it properly. He just said, Kyle's unhappy. And so, like, Rick was like, oh, well, if Kyle's unhappy, then... Not to, not to, not to be... Not to sound biased, but that's, that's Kyle's opinion that it wasn't relayed properly to, and right, you know, that's it's one side of it. But it is right. just one side. But I thought it was an interesting because I'd never heard either any side. I, of it. I just thought it was interesting. I, I hadn't heard that either. So anyway, I I'm getting off topic because I'm not even talking about Kyle Busch. But my pick is, for the featured paint scheme, the 2007 NASCAR Busch series, because that is what we're talking about. I know I've gotten off topic. I hope Josh is looking up Lauren Wallace right now. Uh, my pick is the number 99 XM satellite radio Toyota driven by Huda Man, David Rudiman, for Michael Waltrip Racing in the USG Sheetrock 300 at Chicagoland Speedway in 2007. Now, the interesting thing about this, uh, this is uh, a car that Rudiman ran only once. Now, keep in mind, David Rudiman was competing for uh, Nextel Cup Rookie of the Year at this time. Uh, in addition to, so he's run a full season in Nextel Cup, and then he's running a full season in the Bush Series as well. So he's running in full seasons in both uh, in both series. He does compete in both races, except he just dis- doesn't qualify for certain cup races, which probably made it easier for him to compete in the full Bush series. Um, but he ran this car in the Bush series only once at that uh, track. So this car is is really cool because let me tell you something. XM Satellite Radio it's did not car. sponsor cars very often, but the, the cars that they did looked outstanding. And this is another sure. one because this has flames on it. I mean, this has a yellow hood with flames. And then the black base makes it look even more slick. Now, if you've ever seen Brian Herta's uh, 2005, 2004 uh, IRL Indy car, now that's what I'm talking about for the XM satellite sponsorship. Now, that's always going to be one of my favorite looking Indy cars. But uh, for the sake of this, this I picked this one because this one was one of my favorite looking ones as well. Um, and I very, very, very vaguely remembered it. Uh, and I'm glad that I saw it because I was like, I want to talk about this one. Um, and I, 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 I'm dumb because I wrote down where he finished and then I, no, I looked up where he finished and I didn't even bother to write it down. So now I can't remember where he finished. I think it was 17th. It was like 17th or something. Um, so it wasn't like he did great, but then I actually, I went on to say that because this car is on a gen four Toyota Camry, that makes it even better because this is what can happen. You put any car on an, uh, a 2000 Monte Carlo, a 2000 Pontiac, or a 2007 Toyota Camry in from the NASCAR bodies. And instantly, no matter what car it is, it looks better. It just looks better. It just automatically looks better. I mean, you, you, you take it off the Ford or the Dodge body, doesn't matter. You put it on one of those, those bodies, it automatically looks better. Can I have a hot take on that one? Yes, go for it. The rainbow car looked better on the Monte Car the 95 to 99 Monte Carlo than it did the 2000 Monte Carlo. Not, not to be again. I'm, 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 ho- I'm homering Gordon so far in, in 2021. But yeah, I would say this: the rainbow car looked better on the 95 to 99 Monte Carlo. Yeah, I liked but, it more on the on the on the on the OO car Monte Carlo. I, I always liked that one more specifically. Well, I, I agree that the O oh, the 2000 to 2002 Monte Carlo is is right, and I'm agreeing with you there. Like I'm saying, I'm not, I'm, I'm not criticizing that. I'm saying like. Gordon's rainbow scheme running on that specific Monte Carlo to me appealed to me more 
than it did on the previous ones. And, and maybe- even more so when it came back on the 04 Monte Carlo. Wow. I didn't like it when it came back on the 04 Monte Carlo. I still liked it on the 2000 Monte Carlo. And maybe it was only because they only ran it one year and also because looking back, it wasn't the greatest of season. You know, Gordon didn't. It was a terrible you know, season for yeah, Gordon. He had three wins, finished like eight. He's eighth in the standings. I know that's terrible. People would kill for that. Three wins, eighth in the standings. What are you talking about? That's awesome. But um, for Gordon's standards at the time, it wasn't that great. Um, by the way, not to hijack, I did watch that commercial. I I remember it now. I just remember it now. Thank you. Good. Wasn't good. Uh, but yes, I did. That that Those were good commercials. Those were good commercials. It's just sad that Mike Wallace turned out to be a piece of crap. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're you're looking at me, and, and I'm just, I, I'm I'm sorry. I mean, the dude is still banned from NASCAR, and he won't. Uh, he's not coming back. Yeah, I don't think he'll come back. Yeah, he's never come back. He's never come back because NASCAR has gone too soft. They're too PC now. They're all run by snowflakes. That's that's Mike Wallace's words, not mine. That's literally Mike Wallace's words. Yeah, I think we should move on to this week's winners, and before we get to talk top takeaways. Yeah, I, I agree on that because uh, we got a lot to talk about in the top takeaways. Uh, so this week's winners, the Arkham Menard Series East Race at Five Flag Speedway. Sammy Smith won that. A total of 13 cars entered. Uh, Josh, do you have uh, any? I did not watch this race. Did you, did you watch this race? I, and I didn't watch was this it race. Was it any good? I, like, I didn't watch the race, no. The only thing I, I, I put 13 total cars there because it just reinforces my opinion that they should have combined the three divisions. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. 13, yeah, of 13 course. cars is too small for a for any NASCAR race at that level. They should have they should have combined the three divisions of ARCA into a single one, made it one big tour all year, all year long from from February to November. That's what they should have done. Um, I'm with you. Uh, Supercars opened their season with the Bathurst 500 instead of the Bathurst 1000. The Bathurst 500. Uh, Shane Van Gisbergen swept the weekend, winning both races of that weekend. Uh, Formula E was in Saudi Arabia. Race one was run by Nick DeVries, and race two was taken by Sam Bird. Uh, that interesting fact, Nick DeVries, that was his first win for Mercedes and his first win since, I think, 2019 Formula 2 season, which he was the champion on, and this is Sam Bird's first win uh, as a Jaguar driver. He's been in his entire Formula E career with the Virgin Racing team. He's moved over to Jaguar Racing for 2021, and he has uh, scored his first win. Um, And then in the Xfinity Series at Homestead, we had Myatt Snyder becoming a first-time winner in the Xfinity Series. Myatt Snyder wins. Uh, Really cool to see him win that one. I know he's a big fan favorite amongst at least a lot of the people I talked to. Uh, and then the Cup Series at Homestead, William Byron. Willie B got his second career win uh, and, and at, Holmes, at, at Homestead, uh, first with crew chief Rudy Fugel as well. Um, so that's a huge, huge deal there. Uh, now moving into some of the top takeaways because we finished up. That was literally all the races that happened this week. I know we said it was packed, but we're going to start with the Formula E races because those are the, basically the first two races of the weekend. Um, so the first Formula E race started on Friday. Uh, which was actually Saturday night, their time in Saudi Arabia. Um, or, or it's Friday night there, or Saturday night. I can't remember what. It, I I think they're you know they're still on the same days we are, so that it would have been Friday night going into Saturday. Okay. Um, but anyway, so it was uh, Nick Cassidy's Formula E debut. I know I've talked about for- Nick Cassidy a while when we discussed Super Formula on this show, but he made his Formula E debut uh, this weekend as actually teammates with Sam Bird at Jaguar. Uh, which was really cool. Uh, and then Nick DeVries, like I already said, the 2019 Formula 2 champ, led wire to wire from the pole. So again, Mercedes' dominance continues. But this time, instead of in Formula 1, it's in Formula E. Um, but thankfully, they didn't sweep the weekend. Uh, and, and in fact, we're going to get into what happened in Mercedes. They didn't even partake, partake qualifying for race 2, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. Uh, Eduardo Mortara finished P2 for Venturi, a huge way to start the season for Venturi. But again, going into race 2, all of this is going to unravel soon because the highs and the highs that were, are going to be experienced are going to switch. And actually, interesting fact, Alex Lynn took out Sam Bird in race one. So Sam Bird didn't even finish the first race. I mean, Alex, I don't know what Alex Lynn was doing in that. He just that drove it right eight, in. The car. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah, I saw that. That was, a, that was an saw odd that. move. I'm not sure what he was trying to do there. And and yeah, the cars, Josh was making it. Uh, they, they got stuck nose to nose, basically. Yeah. Josh was uh, the, making the, a hand the gesture the here that that you couldn't see where he was pointing. They were nose to nose. That's how they got kind of wedged in between the walls. Um, and so, 
yeah, moving into race two. So, like I said, all of this is going to kind of come crashing down, except for Sam Bird, who, like I said, is going to go on to win the race two. And he's going to probably be the only happy person that's going to leave Saudi Arabia right now. Uh, and so here's what happens. So, in, cra- in practice, Eduardo Mortara crashes uh, in practice. Now, Venturi describes this later as a brake failure. So they say there's a brake failure. It's a there's a there's a damaged part. They're concerned about it. So as a result, Mercedes and Venturi uh, do not attempt to qualify, and uh, Mortara uh, elects not to start. So Venturi essentially says, "Okay, we're going to qualify our other car, but we're not, but Eduardo is not going to start, even though he was cleared to race because uh, they did take him to the hospital for a little bit. But he was later cleared to race. But I think the car was just too damaged, uh, and they they opted not to start the race. But uh, the other Venturi car and the other Mercedes cars did. Um, and so Sam Bird is going to win the race, like I've already mentioned. But then it's what happens towards the end. So here's here's the sequence of events that I, I explained this to Josh beforehand. But to all of our loyal listeners here, if you didn't catch the Formula E event, uh, the race two at Saudi Arabia, here's kind of, a, 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 I guess what I want to say, the Spark Notes version of what happened. Not really the Spark Notes. I'm going to go pretty in depth. But uh, here's essentially what happened. So. You have a race with about 10 minutes left in the in, in the race. So remember, Formula E races are timed races, 45 minutes plus a lap. Uh, so about there's about 10 laps left in the race. And uh, you have an accident where uh, Max Gunter, he locks up and he just hits Tom Blumkiss, Blumkiss. Now, this is televised. So everybody sees this accident happen. Um, the contact between Gunter and Blumkiss. So all of a sudden now, then, Formula E throws a red flag and decide to end the race early. So there's 10 minutes left that is now off the clock. They're going to end the race. There was two minutes left, I think, after the they threw the red flag. They had a caution come out. They waited a long time for the cleanup caution, then they threw the red, and then they threw the, then they decided to end the race. Um, so it's not revealed until much later. In fact, not until 24 hours later that we actually see an official video. We saw unofficial video from crowds posting uh, this accident, but the official accident that brought out the red flag was not posted until 24 hours later, and it was caught on closed-circuit television. So the, the broadcast cameras did not catch this accident. It was not until Formula E got a hold of closed-circuit security camera footage where they actually found video and footage of this accident, where Alex Lynn essentially got blocked by Mitch Evans or whatever it would have you. Something happened where they were almost into the wall. Lynn essentially blows over the top, almost like Mark Webber did at uh, Valencia in 2010. He blows over, the car flips over, it slides and skids on its roof, and they take Alex Lynn out, and he's going to go to the hospital. So Alex Lynn's not had a great race, great great couple of races, because he wrecked uh, Sam Bird and heard from him, obviously, and now he's in the hospital. He got released later, but at, you know it's just a bad ra- way to end the race. Um, and then, uh, Jean-Éric Verne was later demoted from third to 12th. And here's the reason. Here's the reason. Want to know why, what do you think? I want to, Josh, do you know why Jean-Éric Verne was demoted? I did not see that. Okay. Do you want to take a guess? Why, random guess. Don't look at the script. Take a random guess why Jean-Éric Verne was demoted from third <laughs> off the podium to 12th. Uh, an illegal block. Nope. It was nothing he did on track that was Nothing he did on track? How the heck does that happen? Here's what happened. You know, there was supposed to be 10 minutes left in the race, right? Right. Well, Jeff hadn't used his second attack mode yet. He was saving it for the end of the race. Well, when the end of the race didn't happen, the FIA and the Formula E determined that he had, since he had not used his second attack mode, which is required of all drivers, that he would get a, a time penalty, which demoted him from 3rd to 12th. What? Yeah. So he got so, a penalty. So, so he was going to use it. Obviously, he had to use it. But because of a crash, and he was unable to use it, he gets penalized for it? Yes. That, that is, is the exactly what happened. stupidest thing I think I've ever heard you say about an FIA race. Yeah. That is, that is a real thing that happened. Now, as, as, and as we were talking about before, do you want this Formula E race to get even crazier, Josh? You thought that was crazy. You yeah. thought they didn't televise an accident. Right. They left viewers in complete confusion for about 20 minutes trying to figure out why this race was ended early. Why did it uh, crash? Surely that accident was not the reason that why, you know, uh, Gunter hitting Blumquist. That wasn't the, the red flag accident. We don't know. Now, 
get this. Here's what app gets even worse is after the race, we find out that there was a missile, a missile intercepted near the racetrack, near the capital city of Saudi Arabia. This happened uh, uh, near it. Um, and this was, and this is all from an AP report that I heard, and as well as other uh, sources that I am going to call uh, trusted. <laughs> I think they're trusted. I just don't know them personally. That's why. Um, but this this missile was essentially allegedly targeting uh, a very important guest that was at the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. Grand e Prix, excuse me. Uh, the Sa crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, who, believe me, is a very controversial figure because in and, – and we don't normally talk normal news on this show, but if you're not really familiar with this guy, uh, it was re announced this past week that U.S. intelligence uh, was able to confirm that um, this Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, did in fact order and sign off on the killing of a uh, journalist for the Washington Post, Jamal Khashoggi. Um, this, again, is a big deal. So naturally, he's a pretty big enemy. So there's this missile launched from, according to the AP, Yemen, uh, that's essentially tra traveling towards the track. Now, what's going on at this track after this race is uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia is doing a photo shoot on the track. So that's where this missile is basically heading. Um, and so now you're getting into a situation where you have an attack on one person that could have very well injured multiple other people within the paddock that were not supposed to be targets of this missile at all, but very well could have been. Um, and you're going to seriously sit here and tell me that there's nothing wrong with going to Saudi Arabia. And at the very least, at the very least, maybe don't ha allow such a controversial leader to be present at the Grand Prix when you know people are out to kill him. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just throwing that out there. Maybe in the, you know, in the effort of safety, we shouldn't, you know, have very controversial leaders that want to, that are, you know, wanted by many nations, I should say, uh, come out and, and attack him. This is just crazy. So my question to Josh and my question to you, our listeners, you know what my answer is, but should Formula One reconsider the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix in the wake of the missile incident? Because this is a serious thing. This is a serious problem that we have seen. This could have been, a, if this missile is not intercepted by Saudi intelligence, we have a serious tragedy and disaster on our hands. Is quite literally what we're looking at. Now, I'm not saying Maybe, maybe the report's wrong. Maybe we're looking into this too far. Maybe the missile wasn't directly going towards the track. It doesn't matter. Even if the, the missile is going anywhere near that track, it's going to make it almost impossible for any driver, any team, anybody in that paddock to evacuate. Do you have any idea how much danger and how much risk you are putting the drivers in unnecessarily when, when you're going to a, a country that is as unstable as Saudi Arabia? I don't necessarily want to straight up say that, you know, we should bow to terrorists and run away from them. But at this point, when you're looking at strictly the safety of your competitors and your fans and everybody there, you have to stop and say, no, we need to actually reconsider this. We need to – You either Saudi Arabia needs to guarantee that everything is going to be safe, and Lord knows they will try, but we need to have some kind of third party confirm that they're, it's going to be safe, I should say. Um, or we should just not – Formula 1 should just not go there and Formula E should reconsider their contract. Because I know, Josh, you pointed out a Motorsport.com article that came out on the 27th of February. So the day Saturday. before – huh? It was Saturday. Yeah, it was Saturday. So the day, be, the day of this, this – all of this is happening. You post that Formula 1 has got a 10-year contract with Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia has got this whole big thing that they're going to be in 2030. They're going to be this great place. But you still have a, a, a leader that is wanted by all of these countries that are unstable in this sense, that want him dead. And to be honest with you, I, I just, I, I don't want to say anything because this is politics and world politics is not my place, but this is something, but now that we're talking about it in a racing sense, it's kind of our problem now. Yeah. And that's what's unfortunate. It's become our problem and we kind of have to discuss this. Yeah, I, 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 like I said, we talked about before the show. Um, 
my big thing here is can you think of another I, not just not sporting event because it's certainly there's been a sporting events that have been targets of of terrorism um but is i can't think of another f1 race or another race where you were talking about like oh by the way there was a missile launched you know there yeah. was there was there was something like that that endangered people before during or after an event and yeah it is certainly concerning um that part of the world is certainly unstable um you know that's that's nothing new to you know rob rob and i and, and other americans and other people listening to this around the world we all are aware that that certainly certain parts of that region are are more unstable than others we've successfully raced at bahrain and abu dhabi for over a decade without any issue but other parts are not no. Well, you, Even you Bahrain, made, the 2011 Bahrain oh, thing, the yeah. thing about that was, was we prevented that by canceling the event. That's true. And yeah. what happened was we let it play out. We let, they let this, the Arab Spring play out, play out. And as soon as that, all of that played out and stuff started to become relatively more stable, yeah. they, we had no problems at Abu Dhabi later in that season. That's true. You know, I'm not, there's usually, usually if you guarantee the safety and if everything's going well, there's really no problems racing in the Middle East. I don't personally have a major issue with it. If there's race fans out there, I believe they deserve the opportunity to go see a race. I'm not going to say that just because you live in the Middle East, that means you don't get to see a race. I think that's silly. They should be allowed to see a race if they want to uh, and if their country can bring it to them. But I would just worry that those fans would be put in harm's way unnecessarily. Right. Right. I, I think that I don't we, let's not kid ourselves here. There are conversations being had, you know, at, you know, already and are going to be uh, had going forward in preparation. You know, there, the Saudi Arabia race is, is not until uh, December 5th of this this year. Um, it, it, it is certainly I, I can't wrap my mind around that completely at the moment i i it still is just shocking to me and and it, hopefully things get sorted out you can guarantee safety there will be lessons learned you know er, you know from this from this weekend that okay what can we do to prevent to the best of our ability a repeat incident of this and does that does that mean certain individuals shouldn't attend you know uh, you know i um, I'm not sure the FIA can walk in and say, Hey, you're not allowed in here, um, because of who you are, because of what you've done and what, what you, what you say, I, I'm not sure they can do that. Um, at least not in certain countries, at least I'll put it like that. And that's all, I, that's all I'll say about it. Yeah. And I think my last point about it is going to be simply, I think. It should be down if if somebody is making threats. Let's say we're going to Russia and there's somebody making threats toward Vladimir Putin, which is which would be entirely possible. If these threats are valid and credible, and you're seeing legitimate threats where people have missiles, people are going. It would be foolish, not just for the country and for the leader themselves, but also for the sanctioning body and the people who invite them to still say, "Yeah, Putin, come on in." Even though there's this maniac out here who might try and kill you and all of us, all of the rest of us, let's just go ahead and, you know, not do it. And, and we might get another situation like that where they're like, oh, well, we could just intercept the missile. Well, yeah, you intercept the missile, but you still scare the living crap out of all these other people. You know, I mean, you don't want to force the public into a panic. And that's my another one of my concerns is let's not force the public into a panic because – if Saudi and, and this is another thing again too, if Saudi Arabia is serious about trying to clean up their image, which they say they're doing, I don't believe it. I don't think anybody believes it, but they say they're doing it. A giant terrorist attack at a Formula One event or anything could be the end of that, and they would not recover from it. In the it, it would take them a long time to recover from it. I think right. financially and from a tourism perspective as well. Yeah. So the last thing it would be better, in my opinion. If they said, we're not going to go today, we're not going to go this year, but we're maybe going to go explore it. You know, we want to keep and maintain this partnership, but we're going to maybe explore it when things are a little bit less tense in the right. area, which I think would be if, if 
if it's how Bahrain reacted, I think it would be like, okay, okay, we get it. You know what I mean? Um, all right, so moving on to the Xfinity series here, let's talk about this. <laughs> what the heck? Uh, ramen noodle head Santino Ferrucci made his uh, debut in the Xfinity series. This happened. Uh, he had really no idea what he was doing, but where did he finish, Josh? Do you know? Uh, he was elevate. Well, let's talk about that for a second. I don't know if he had no idea what he was doing. I shouldn't say he had no idea what he was doing, but he was definitely <laughs> very new. He was running, uh, I forget where he, he started 20-something. He got up to the, uh, the teens yeah. um, before the end of stage one, which I thought was a solid job. Um, but then he hit the wall. He said, I found it on the radio. I found it, which I, <laughs> I, thought, was, I thought was, you know, in a way comical because he said, I hit the wall. He said, I found it. He's kind of, I think it's just the Santino Ferrucci a lot of us see. He's kind of a little jokester a little bit. He's like, I found it. And that kind of ruined his day a little bit. And he ends up finishing 31st, is elevated to 30th with Tyler Reddick being DQ'd. We'll talk about that in a minute, minute but, um, or, uh, or Reddick in a minute. But prior to that, he was running better than I expected. And um, I wish that the wall hit wouldn't have come so early. I wish he would have gotten more time in the car with a clean car, learning how it's feeling, you know, and, and maybe not push the envelope so quick. I never saw a replay or and never heard an explanation of why he hit the wall, but uh, I, I wish we would have seen more of a clean race from him, or at least a longer clean race, and, you know, maybe towards the end of it, he starts pushing the limit and, you know, just learning. But I, you know, I, I thought, he, until he hit the wall, I thought he did a solid job. But also, I'll throw this out. Never heard his name. The rest of the race didn't cause any trouble. I mean, that's good because especially they were really trying to tell you he was this great guy in the pre-race. I don't know if you were watching that, but man, Fox went all out trying to make sure nobody knew him about 2018. He's really trying to bury that. He's never going to talk about it again. He's never going to address it, I swear. nobody. He's never going to address it. Well, I mean, how- Mazepin, Mazepin it, it's really bad when I'm sitting here saying, hey, hey, bud. The most hated guy in Formula One right now just just did you one better. Just literally won you. And I don't think Ferrucci cares. I don't think he ever he's never going to care. He's just going to he's going to ride this for the rest of his life saying, I am a bad boy, and he's just gonna have that tattooed on his forehead and everybody's gonna know it. And I I think Larry you know Mack- what? if he makes a career for himself in NASCAR, good for him. But did we're always gonna remember twenty years. Did you see that? He's like, what? I'm sure he's controversial, and I kind of like. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, okay, I don't don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. Everyone on that there's show, controver- there's there's being controversial. There's being Tony Stewart controversial, and then there's being Shane Meal controversial. Yeah, try to be Tony Stewart controversial. Yeah, so I think don't don't kid yourself, folks. Everyone on that Fox broadcast and every journalist in the in the NASCAR media circles knows of the incident anyone who's you know you know you know kelly crandall wrote wrote a story on on him following the race yeah she knows what's going on but you if you if you ask him hey can we talk about this and his, him or his pr guy says no we're not going to discuss that you're not going to get an answer from it you're not going to get him to talk right. about it so if he's you're not probably to never about allowed it. to talk about it yeah, like if I bet not- if you sit get a get if you, if a journalist is lucky to sit down with Ferrucci, I guarantee you the number one thing the PR person gives you in an email or in a phone call or whatever is do not mention 2018. Yeah, that's as simple as that. You, you you're not going to get there. So until he's willing to open up about it, Rob, you and I'm sure many others are now not going to get the answers and and I I don't want to call it an apology, but. An acknowledgement of what happened. You're not going to get that until he wants to open up about it. I don't so. know when he will. It's just amazing to me that it took Mazepin, like, what? what is this now? Two, three months to admit he was wrong, and it's taken Ferrucci three years? Three, four years? Three years now? I, well, I, he hasn't even done it. I, two, I guess, it, it, yeah, it's almost, it's almost three. It'll be three, three, three years in this summer. If he doesn't admit it by this summer, it'll be three years. And I and I yeah. wouldn't and I wouldn't count those chickens. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't start doing that. I would I would let him keep walking on that one. Let's talk I, about. I the- hope he does well in NASCAR. I I just 
Because I don't want to see the guy outright fail. I don't want to see him fa- fall flat on his face. I just literally, I don't, this is the thing. I, I get, I'm hung up on Frucci all the time, but I've said this time and time again. I don't want him to see him fail. I don't want to see him fall flat on his face. I just want him to be a little bit hum. I just want to sh- see him show humility and be humble for a minute. But I've just never seen that. And that's why I get so on him because it's like, I'm still waiting for this. I'm well, still waiting for something I feel like you should have done years ago. Well, and maybe one of these days he will. He's just not to that point yet. You know, he he is still young. He's not a – he hasn't been around this sport for 15 years. You know, get, he, yeah. yeah. On, a, on a professional level, that's something that probably comes with age and wisdom and looking at other people who have admitted their their wrongdoings and, and say, I can, I can do that now. I feel comfortable doing that now. I, I think that yeah. that that's part of it. Tire strategy, Xfinity race, good tire strategy. That was good. I, I loved it. Um, well, both talk- races had great strategy. Yeah, it, it was a great race. I loved the Xfinity race. Comers and goers all day long. Yeah, um, and a lot of that again came came down to kind of the how the cautions fell. I mean, I kind of felt bad for some of these guys who had that extra set of tires and they didn't get the caution. To use it, I mean, because look, I loved how at the end of stage one and the end of stage two, we get this caution. I think both of them were actually for Stefan Parsons, but we get this caution in Austin Cindric in that in the end of stage two restarts twenty second and within two laps is in the lead. It was amazing, or three laps, three laps. I think he caught. I think it was on the the third lap of the of the green flag cycle that he got the lead, but that was. That was fun to watch. And he was – and Almondinger and Haley did the same thing. It, it were, there was no question that that tires were king. And I – I mean – Speaking of, of tires. And it also kind of speaks to the track too. I mean, look. Yeah. Homestead, I get it. I get the people out there like, why isn't this still the season finale? I thought – I and, and I know you – I'm in the same before. boat. It is a great – it is a great track for racing. No doubt about that. I think we need to figure out what is Homestead doing right, what's right about Homestead, and how can we get other tracks to duplicate the racing that comes out of that, uh, that is produced via the track, but also look at the tire, you know, the package and all that. Because the Xfinity race was, was in general a far better racing race than the Cup was. But that's that's in gen- that's all every week. That's I every think week. the fact that every week. I think the fact of the matter was this week we got so lucky we got a good Cup race and a good Xfinity race. That just doesn't happen. That's a very rare thing to happen. Usually the Xfinity race is always going to be good, but mm-hmm. the Cup race is usually a toss up of whether or not it's going to be worth watching. You know this this week it was I was so impressed and and, and I want to talk about the Xfinity series still, but I was just so impressed with the way the Cup series went. But the Xfinity series, the thing I want to talk about the most is is the thing that happened at the very end of the race. And uh, <laughs> this guy this guy is, is doubling down. This guy is doubling down. So Noah Gregson is totally doubling down. Uh-huh. He is not happy with David Starr. And, he did not uh, see a replay before that TV interview at all. He needs to see a replay. No, no. He, he, I think he's seen a replay. He doesn't care. He's still on Twitter today saying, defending it. Like saying, oh, I... I, I, it was, I think it was this morning. Someone said, "Well, he courted a tire. That's why he blew the tire." And Noah Gregson was like, "I courted a tire in stage one. I was fine." And I was like, "Great, whatever. Does, does that doesn't mean anything?" David Starr courted a tire running twelfth. I, I, I don't want to hear it, buddy. I don't want to hear it. It was just bad luck. That was bad luck. That was bad luck all around. Look, no, Gre- no. I honestly think you could have a Cindric Almondinger Graxon winner list in the Xfinity series this year. And Graxon, without a doubt, I, I put on here, Junior Motorsports, they are struggling. Their best driver right now is 17th in points with Annette. Is it really Michael Annette? Yeah, because Graxon and My and man, it, this is why it pays to. It, it, this is, again, this is why it pays to be a pay driver that doesn't tear up equipment. It's Michael true. Annette, my boy. Michael Annette. Keep bringing in that money and keep bringing those cars home in one piece, man. Because look, look, look at this. They've had, they've had, well, with the elevation now after Reddick's disqualification, they have two top tens. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, it was only one top 10, but they've only, they only have four top 15 finishes in 12 starts. So that's four cars, three races, four times three is 12 for people who aren't getting that. But um, I'm bad at math. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. So Noah Graxon just about kind of was like the silver lining on this all day. And he should have won that race. Okay. Yeah, I, I would argue he should have won the race. Yeah. That was the, he was the winner of that race. I think it kind of goes back to, to the, to the cup series, the first two races, the driver who should have won the race didn't win the race. Um, and yeah, I just felt so bad for him. And I knew I was, I was love that they had it on, on TV live. I couldn't believe what I was watching. And I'm like, he's going to be mad. I was honestly expecting him to go out there and go chase Elliot on the field, Darlington may, 2020 and and stand out there and, and give him the one finger salute as he drove by um and i think he kind of wanted to but i think he's like i don't have time to wait around no, I he's like if i'm gonna get fined i'm gonna do it for swearing on tv well i don't think he's gonna get fined for saying that um on tv because fcc things have our rules have loosened up and anyways yeah, he definitely didn't see a replay before that. I'm kind of surprised he's doubling down on it. But I, you know what? That's he no. Is, check his tweets. No. Check his tweets. He's doubling down. He's replying to anybody who's calling, who's saying it it what it wasn't David Starr's fault. Anybody who says it wasn't David Starr's fault, like he said it to Dave Moody for crying out loud. Like this guy is going well, all in. Well, okay. Uh, I I can't blame him. I love the per- I love this Noah Graxon that we see because Noah Graxon is a better race car driver when he is in this type of zone. We saw last year when he started to calm down, he wasn't as good. He just he didn't produce the results. But then this the like the latter third of the third of the year where he got more aggressive but wasn't wrecking other people to do it, he was getting these he, he was racing just just so much better. Probably should have been in the championship four, and now he's just all, all out again. I love before the race that this checkers are records, man. It's checkers are records, and and it was going checkers. He didn't wreck himself. Lady Luck struck him in the wrong way, and that's that sucks. That and sucks. and uh, Carl Long is not happy with him. Carl Long had a very long winded Facebook page. Uh, written only in the way Carl Long can, meaning poor punctuation and capitalization. But um, yeah, he's not happy. And someone told me I, I'm not. I'm not going to give a, a a source on this because I I don't really know. I don't really know where it came from. But I someone told me that Gregson is kind of screwing himself here because someone told me that if, um, if Carl Long and MBM enter any cars at Talladega then Beard's going home. Yeah. Like so Carl Long could literally have the last laugh here if he yeah. wants to. It's true. It's true. Um I mean that that's un, that's unless Beard enters a race before Talladega which I don't think they will. Um So yeah. Of course that's a if, if Beard puts Gregson in the car which I don't know who who else initially would? Who else are they going to put in? I mean, he was handpicked by Brandon Gaunt. No, he's a Las Vegas boy. Um, because all well, the other two Las Vegas guys drive a Ford and a Toyota. So, yeah. Let's. He's obviously not going to. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other three Vegas boys who aren't already in Cup are in a Ford and a Toyota. But yeah, what did you think about the end of the race, man? Uh, do you think Tyler crazy. Reddick? Race one, if if that if if the caution doesn't come out there, yeah, one? definitely. I mean, Reddick had the dominant car. Reddick had the dominant he, car of the day, and really yeah. both races. I would argue. I mean, the thing about it, th- this is the thing that I really liked, and and I know we criticize. Here's the thing I'm going to say. I know we criticize 3 p.m. starts all the time. Yeah. And in the Daytona 500, I think it's perfectly acceptable to criticize 3 p.m. starts. I think there's certain races where there's no reason to have them start in the day and end at night. But I think Homestead was the one exception where that actually ended up playing into the race's hands as, as, as a, an enjoyable race because track. Huh? It's a great transition track. It, it, it really is though. You saw it it, not only in the Xfinity series, but then also in the cup series, more so in the cup series, Chris Busher was really good in the cup series. As soon as it got dark, Busher was 20th. 
Well, that all happened on a restart. He got he got crapped on on the restart. True. The restart roulette. He got shuffled back, and he did. In in the way the momentum works, he dropped like a freaking rock. That he, never card never re, re, returned correct. to the performance that it was. Correct. And I, I I'm not saying it was because of dirty air because I think the car was just fine in dirty air prior to all that. That car just never came back. Uh, once the sun went down, but the same thing happened with the Xfinity series where Reddick uh, really wasn't much of a factor when the sun was out, but when the sun came down, that was when I was worried. And that is actually conveniently when Brett Moffat started to, to fall off too, was Moffat started to fall off a little bit when the sun went down and that's when Reddick started to come back. Yeah. Well, and I think Reddick just, I mean, look at where he won the two championships in the Xfinity series. It was yeah. Homestead late at night and he, he knows how to get around Homestead cooler weather so i mean february november yeah because i mean truthfully once it gets dark in home in florida i mean i'm not i'm not sure how many of our listeners are from florida and josh have you ever been to florida i've been to florida a couple times okay so you know what we're talking about like in the winter in florida it's like sunny and 60 uh, upper 60s like most of the day and then as soon as that sun goes down it's like 30 degrees most of the time. So, I mean, track conditions are going to change very rapidly when that time goes down. I mean, look at if you, I mean, I wish the Cup Series especially was shown. Hey, this is when we started at 348 when we threw the green flag. Here, were the, here was the air temperature. Here was track temperature. Now, 10 laps to go, here's the air temperature. Here's track temperature. I mean, you're going to see a, a good 15, 20 degree difference alone. And the cooler temperatures are only going to give those, those tires more grip, which is where mm-hmm. – Reddick excelled late in and that. Once, race. once these guys started to be able to use that top lane, I mean, yeah, yeah, really finding grip up there, it was it was over for everybody else. It was over for everyone else. And I think I thought it was great, you know, not, just to kind of put a put a pin in the Xfinity series. I love that Myatt Snyder got that, you know, kind of learned oh. his lesson there. You know, he's okay. Here's what not to do. And then you had the the two time champion. You know, and I and I love that I loved his comment at the end too. It was it was so true though, but it's also a sponsorship plug. We slayed them. I love it because like you're you're exactly right because Reddick didn't have a choice on that restart when he spun his tires. If he if he just side drafts the two of Mayant Snyder, I think the twenty two at least goes around him, and now you're three wide off a of turn two, and you don't know what's going to happen there. He had to block. The 22 and the, the 18 of Hemrick, who was on the, going on the outside there. I mean, you were looking at a four or five wide situation. And at that point, Mayat Snyder, all he had to do was hold on for two laps. And if there was a three, if, it, if overtime was three laps, he doesn't win that race because Reddick had the better car. Of course, he gets disqualified afterwards, which makes you feel better because let's say Mayat Snyder finishes second to, to Reddick in, a, in, a, in that race. Reddick gets disqualified um, for ride height issues. Um, you're glad that Mayak got to experience the first win, you know, yeah. front stretch. Yes, the interview instead of like, hey, knock on your door, knock, knock, knock. Hey, by the way, you won the race. Reddick's disqualified when you should come out here and take pictures. What? You know, so you feel good for that. So you feel a good situation. You feel bad for Reddick and, and, and then the Hour Motorsports joint effort with RSS Racing that they get disqualified. They lose that money. They lose those ownership points. Um but I, I'm, I feel good for Maya that everything went right for him in yeah. his first celebration. So that was really cool, especially for him. He's been a journeyman. He, he, yes, everyone, he has. 22 years old. No, he's like 26. He's like 26 years old. He's he's raced in the trucks before. He's raced a season over in Europe in the – That's right. Yeah, he did NASCAR right. wheel and Euro Series for a little yeah. bit. Yeah, so he, he, he's been a – he's kind of had his own little – version of a of again a journeyman so for him to land the ride last year at, at rcr which turned into a then a full-time effort with rcr and rss racing and now to have this full-time effort with with rcr all season long you got to feel good for the guy and oh, i do it's shaping up to be obviously a pretty good playoff i because i i think uh I, I, I don't know how th- big of a threat he'll be, but I like the way the season is starting to play out. The, the, the players he's in the playoffs. He's in the playoffs. But it, even the people who aren't locked in yet, um, I, I like how the Xfinity Series is shaping up. Speaking of playoff outlook, let's take a look at the Cup Series because, wow. Yeah, if this you- playoff outlook is uh, not something that I had going 
early, no. or, or early. Uh, so it's the seating, seating uh, as it goes right now. I'm pretty sure is McDowell, uh, and then, um, and then, then Bell, and Byron. then Byron, 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 right? Yeah, okay, yeah. that makes yeah, sense. So that's that's broken. seating right now. Uh, and, <laughs> um, McDowell is actually higher in points than I expected him to be. So he's well, really his entire purpose must be to just make me a fool. You know what? Like, but, but you know, I, he's. Let, let me tell you something about Michael McDowell. Last three, two, three. This is why I said what I said because the last two or three seasons, he has been the lowest finishing full time driver in points. Lowest finishing full time driver in points. So the driver who ran every single race, all thirty six races, he finished the lowest out of all of those. In, like for the past two or three years, he has. And so, if you're going to sit here and tell me that my assumption preseason was not far fetched, then you, sir, are a liar. But if you are calling me an idiot now, that is fair because. Obviously, McDowell is six in points, three races in, and has a win and is in the playoffs, and anything can happen. <laughs> I can't remember where he finished in points, so I can't, you know, say that you're wrong or right on that one. But I think he's six I in points. I, I know he finished I, I, six this weekend. I believe, yeah, he finished it. He, he, for, I tweeted about it today on on the pods. Or, or the I post. know you did. He got three straight top tens. He's never done that before, and I didn't even think about it. He's never gone back to back top tens either. These guys off to a great start. Is it going to end? You know, is he going to be able to get four in a row? I mean, the odds, my guess in general, statistically, are probably going to tell you, yes, it's going to come to an end at Las Vegas. But if it doesn't, look, the front row motorsports car has been getting better progressively the past few seasons. And McDowell has been the guy who has been like found himself running in the top 10 in the middle of the race of the middle of the race, but has been able to close on it. And they begin a lot of top 15s, a lot of top twenties were five, six years ago. That wasn't the case. So good for them. Good for front row of Bob Jenkins and everyone over on those two cars where, um, we're seeing this, another team where it's kind of like, like JCC Dordery. Maybe last year, last two years, were like they've been running better, but haven't been able to close out. It's just good to see someone else in the in the in the battle, battling for wins, battling for top ten points. And you know, yeah, he won the day two five hundred. That's kind of a that's a wild card race. I've always pointed to Michael McDowell. He don't sleep on him on road courses. He always finds himself running in a good position. Some of these had bad bad luck struck him, but. Yeah, I, 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 and, and short tracks too, because short tracks too. I'm telling you, the short tracks, road courses, super speedways are all wild cards anymore. You never know who's gonna, you never who's gonna win or, or finish well, get top tens there. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed watching this run. I hope it continues for him because it's a great story. What I do you mean, think, Rob? I'm, I'm amazed that Michael McDowell is fourth in points. Yes. Uh and he's fourth in points. He's yes. got 106. He is two back from Joey Logano in third. Uh, and to my knowledge, actually, no, it, it is true. This is absolutely true. This is the best start to the season of Michael McDowell's entire career. Well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Every single other race, he, he might have a – he's got a top 10 or a top 5 or so here at Daytona. But then by the very next race, he's back to finishing 25th or lower. Okay, can you tell me who the uh, I know who I know the answer. I'm asking you if you saw it today uh, or you looked it up. Can you name the other driver who's finishing the top ten in all three races this year? There's only one other one. I didn't know. I didn't see it. Holy cow! Who is it? Kevin Harvick. Oh well, that's not surprising. It's not, yeah, it's not surprising. But I mean, that's eight. Hey, three races in the 2021. Who were the three? Who were the two drivers who had three top tens? My uh, Kevin Harvick and uh, Denny Hamlin. No, Kevin Harvick and Michael McDowell. Great to talk about. Good for him. But in like you mentioned Chris Buescher earlier. That was awesome to see because at the point oh, when I he loved was, it. Um, Ryan Newman was also running in the top 10. So mm-hmm. great to see that. Again, a team that has struggled. Um, whereas you've seen in, in the past three, four years, front row has been getting progressively better. Rosh Fenway has taken steps back. And now to see them... For what you know, what is certainly it's not one reason. It, it's certainly a mixture of reasons why. Whether it's them or, or the or the tracks or the tires or NASCAR rules, they're getting better. That's good to see. It's good to see. 
I don't want to call it parody. I want to see a variety of different teams having having their day in the sun, um, for sure. Um, Rob, I'm surprised you haven't mentioned this already, but um, cars on the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were there were definitely cars in the way, but there's never going to be cars in the way. Well, here's here's the thing. Good. I I I kind of I struggle with because I see both sides. Okay. If you run, if you're a spotter, if you're spotting for Kevin Harvick, right, and you're paying attention, you know the slow cars are, are, or the slower cars are running the high line. You're going to tell your guy, hey, these next two cars, they're running the high line consistently, consistently. Go low. Well, if their spotter's saying run the high line because that's the fastest line around, but, oh, by the way, the leader's coming and run the low line, you're kind of at that point – you're not being cons- consistent on where you're running, so you're confusing the other teams. Honestly, though, I think it just comes down to where they at this stage in the race where a handful of cars got in the way. You were running in the preferred line. Yeah. Run the unpreferred line, which at that at the later stages of the race was around the apron. Run that line, stay out of the way because. The only reason the guys are going to go down there is if they're trying to make a pass and they've got a heck of a run. But even at that point, you still give them the middle. They can try to make the pass there, or they can kind of back up the entry of the corner for a good exit in trying to get another run. Of course, momentum is so important there. But yeah, I was there was there was a couple moments where we were like, oh my gosh, like Reddick had a huge moment. I think it was with Cody Ware. Like he forced the issue, and I yeah. felt like in that situation for sure that that the spotter. In driver of of the was Cody wearing the fifty one? Yeah, Cody's yeah. been in the the purple car. He's been in the purple fifty one. Yeah. They kind of, I felt like they 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 didn't do their courtesy job enough to say, look, I know this guy is racing. It's closing stages of the race. That could have cost a guy a great finish. That could have caused a wreck, a caution, screwed up other people's races like Byron or whoever. I I. I felt like that is a situation where, like, okay, get low. Definitely need to get into the lane where Spotter's got to be on top. Spotter's got to be on top of their job every time. Driver's got to be on top of their job. Fact of the matter is, if you're going to be running around, and if you know you're slower than everybody else, you know you're a down, but you're still racing, which is yeah. fine. You can still go race. You got to be aware of your surroundings. You got to be aware. You got to be running your own race. And at that point, I think it's all about if you see where if you see where the leaders are running, you. Pick a line. You make it very clear where you're going ahead of time, right before you go into the corner, and you stay there. Mm-hmm. You stay there. You don't move. You hold your line. You do whatever. You let off the gas. If you have to let them by, you let them by. You know mm-hmm. they're they're not racing you. You're not racing them. You know I under, you don't even have to let let them by. Or if you do let them by because you know you're the last car on the lead lap, or whatever it doesn't matter. Or you're the last car. You know you're just running last in general. Who cares? That's fine. If you don't want to let off the gas, that's fine too. But for the love of all that is good, you have to make it very clear where you're going. If you're not yep. making it clear where you're going in the racetrack, like when you arc it in, make mm-hmm. sure you're arcing it in and you're saying, I'm going low. So that when the driver behind you says, oh, this guy's going low, I can drive it in up high. And you can just right. pass him and then you just leave him in. Or if the guy says, hey, I'm going to stay up high, then the guy behind you has got to know, oh, okay, you're going up high. I'll go low and pass you. You know, because maybe, maybe there's always opportunities where the lap car says, well, I, I, I can't run low. You know, my car doesn't handle low. I have to run the high line. You have to, you still have to make that clear to the driver behind you because you don't want to end up wrecking that driver, the, the faster car. The faster car doesn't want to wreck with you. So naturally you still have to communicate. It's all about heads up driving. And mm-hmm. sometimes I wonder if some of these slower guys are heads up drivers or not, because well, and- if they're not. Capable and, and of communicating that on the track, it shows me that they haven't been in that situation enough, or they haven't been in a, a situation where that's been necessary before. And that kind of speaks more to inexperience, if anything. Well, and, and look, we talked about this before on the show. I know they talked about it on Door, but don't door Bumper Clear, uh, Del, the other Dale uh, uh, Dirty Mo Media podcast for Dale and her junior, BJ McLeod. Was multiple. DJ is one of the better ones at it. I thought he he he. he, You want to be him. You don't want to be a guy who is 
you know, like we like we mentioned, Cody Ware. You're going to be talking about Cody Ware because he, you know, potentially nearly cost multiple people a good race. BJ McLeod was nowhere to be found all day long, not because he was super slow, not because he spent time behind the wall, because he stayed out of everyone's way and didn't cause trouble. So, and there's a there's the thing about that is you never hear anybody complain about BJ McLeod because BJ McLeod. This is the thing about him is especially when you're talking about guys running in the back. BJ McLeod is not out there trying to impress people. Cody Ware is out there trying to impress people. Garrett Smithley's out there trying to impress people. Josh Balicki's out there trying to impress people. BJ McLeod has nobody to impress. He owns his own team. Everybody, most everybody in the paddock likes him. Nobody, you have never heard, I've never heard anybody say a bad thing about BJ McLeod. So BJ's got nothing to worry about. He's got nothing, no envelopes to push. He's got to just, he's got his own car that he's got to take care of and take home in one piece. And that's what he does. That's that's what he does when he goes out there. What Cody Ware's job is when he goes out there is he's trying to impress somebody. Because like I said last week, I don't think this guy wants to be driving for his dad's team very long. Problem is, he's doing that in his dad's team. In his dad's team, It's all fun and games if you're doing that in a mid-pack car. But when you're doing it in a car that can't run faster than 38th, you probably shouldn't be pushing the envelope. You need to learn to just let guys come and go. And this is coming from me. I like Cody. I don't have any really major problems with him. I like him. But he's got to learn how to not get in people's way. I understand he's trying to make a name for himself and and show people, okay, hey, I'm here. But at the same time, he's got to learn to get out of the way and treat others with uh, the same kind of respect that he would want to be treated with on the racetrack. Yeah. Let's see. The golden rule, I should say. Correct. Let's do one more quick thing, like 30 seconds here before we move on. Kind of do a quick eval of track house versus 2311. I'll, I'll go first here. I think 2311, I that's about what I expected. Um, a lot of learning, a lot of lessons to be learned um, for a new team. Um, and, and then just Bubba just trying to adjust to better equipment that he's been in in a long time as well. Uh, track house, I'm not surprised that they ran so well because look at the, the, the three and the eight. They're an RCR affiliated team, and those two cars run well at, at this track, especially when you have Reddick as a teammate there. It'll be interesting to see how it goes at Las Vegas. I was curious. I actually have the opposite sentiments. I was surprised to see Trackhouse do as well as they did, and I was sur- equally surprised to see 2311 struggle that weekend. Uh, Suarez and Bubba are both really good drivers. So right. I'm not really saying it's it's – talent level but it definitely does seem to come down to either uh what, what's the word i'm looking for uh startup kinks i guess or at the very least just some early bugs that they got to work through you know obviously i don't know you know daniel suarez was it daniel suarez was talking i think somewhere he, he was saying he has one of the best crew chiefs he's one of the best columnist crew chiefs i think it was daniel suarez that said that and that might be great for Suarez. That might be exactly what he needs because I don't know if he's maybe even had that. Uh, right. I don't know what his, his, who his crew chief was at Stuart Haas, but if, you know, knowing Stuart Haas's level of uh, attention that they p- pay to their, let's say, their not most important drivers, i.e. <clears throat> Daniel Suarez, <clears throat> Danica Patrick, <clears throat> Merrick Almirola, um, you know, the guys that don't really matter for them, I guess, the "Quote unquote paid drivers that kind of dare that they're they fund the fourth car right. They usually give them the worst cr- crew chiefs. Trust me, I mean I guarantee you. You, you wonder you, Eric Almirola had the worst crew chief in the world. Danny Patrick had the worst crew chief in the world. They gave uh, Daniel Suarez one of the worst crew chiefs in the world. They, for some reason, Billy Scott kept getting uh, jobs. Daniel Canos kept getting jobs. I don't know why they were both terrible crew chiefs. Chad Johnston wasn't any better. Uh, but uh, you know, I think Suarez having a good crew chief is going to help. But I, think Bubba Wallace. I think it, it him and Mike Wheeler might just be going through some work, uh, some early kinks because you know I look at that you you're I, like I said on in, in at the Daytona 500 I said this is a fifth Gibbs car it genuinely surprises me well, to see him run and struggle as much as he was when I would have expected the car to have more speed in it. Well, and look at the look at the other five or the other four main Toyotas, the four Gibbs cars. They kind of struggled the race too. Martin Truex kind of had Truex a great start. Well, he looked fine, but look at the others. Denny Hamlin, if he wasn't up front, was struggling to find his way through the pack. Kyle Busch was, you know, fifteenth best. Okay, and Kyle then, has not had a good start to the season. Yeah, and and then and then Christopher Bell struggled 
for the majority of the race. So it, it, it kind of is a tale of maybe Toyota just missed the setup, you know? And so move on to Las Vegas. How did, how, how, I think a good measuring tool for Bubba in 2311 racing will be, how did the other four, how did the four Gibbs cars do? How did they do this week? How did, how did, how did they, how did 2311 do? And, is it a track that also Bubba has done done well at? Like if Bub, I expect Bubba to crank out top tens at Martinsville and Bristol easily. Those are two of his best tracks. Dover as well. Um, any quick thoughts on that before we move on? Uh, not. Re- I did have one last thought. Is is when I was talking about crew chiefs. Is I do think that crew chiefs do have something to play into it because they mentioned on the Fox Sports broadcast is that the the three winners have this year have had brand new crew chiefs, McDowell right. and Blickensturber. I yeah. think there's a connection there that's really been helpful. McDowell yeah. and Blick and Surfer together has really been, uh, so far, it's proven to be an absolute race-winning combination. Steve uh, they've turned around Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s latter half of right. his career. You look at uh, Christopher Bell and Adam Stevens. Mm-hmm. Holy cow. Who would have thought that would work? I mean, I did. Adam Stevens is a great crew chief. It's just right. a shame that he bailed on Kyle Busch like he did. Um, and then you got William Byron and Rudy Fru- Fugel. Uh, we, we talked about you talked about this last year that said Rudy Fugel needed to be a was a better crew chief than where he was at Kyle Bush. I mean, Kyle Bush Motorsports was literally just wasting this guy's career. He just walked right in with William Byron, worked with him, and and this is again, this is what I'm talking about is you have familiarity. You have all that familiarity. I think Christopher Bell was more or less familiar with Adam Stevens. I think you had uh you have a situation where Blickensturfer has been working with in the Ford camp for a long time. He's been working with FRM. I think McDowell and him were con- were familiar with one another. And I think in this case, obviously, uh, you have Rudy Fugel and Christopher, or not Christopher, uh, Rudy Fugel and William Byron who have a history. Now you're looking at this. Daniel Suarez is talking about how great his crew chief is. Well, look at the results. The results are there. Well, yeah. look at uh, Bob Wallace. I don't. I've not heard him say anything about Mike Wheeler. I don't know if maybe Mike Wheeler is the best op- option for Bob Wallace because right now I think the first, the early season, especially in this type of NASCAR with no practice, no qualifying, you need to have a good crew chief on your box to make to be able to make the changes and be able to communicate with the driver to make that car go fast because you have to do that on the fly during the race. And if you're not able to do that, you're just going to run out in twentieth, and that's the best you're going to be able to do. And that's why I was worried when Mike uh, Baxter, right, his crew chief from last mm-hmm. year, didn't follow him over to twenty three eleven. Yeah, um, they, and they and they bring Mike Wheeler, and he was he he's been with Toyota for. And Wheeler's a good crew chief. Don't get me wrong, but I'm wondering about his, how his relationship with Bubba is. The chemistry, the C world, C yeah. word, the chemistry, ca- yeah. chemistry, chemistry, absolutely. Let's move on to the outstanding performance because we I are agree. we are on time here. Um, I guess I'll go first. Um. Michael McDowell, I mean, the, he kind of wasn't around there in the first half, but then all of a sudden finds a way to the top 10, finds a way to stay there, um, off to a fantastic start. It's going to come to an end here, you know, soon, you know, the, the top 10 streak will end, but he is he is doing his best in that, in, in that team, that organization is doing the best, and hey, it wasn't just a fluke. We are here to compete to, for wins that aren't just super speedways, that aren't just road courses. We are here to compete for wins. And you never, you know what? The way 2021 has gone, maybe he won another one. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, mine's going to Tyler Reddick. Flat of the fact of the matter is, dude could have swept the weekend if he had a little bit more luck on his side. I, I'm telling you, dude, as soon as, as soon as the, the sun set on both races, this guy, and th- th- this guy was at the front. And this is the thing that he started almost last in the cup race, drove himself all the way up through the field and was in contention. I, I really think if he didn't have to pass uh, Larson and Truex for, in, in the closing stages, he would have if he had, a better had no problem catching up to uh, Byron. If he had a better restart. And also he started 38 yeah. in the Xfinity race too. I, I, I mean, yeah, Tyler Attitude passed, probably passed them more cars than everybody else did. Uh, and, and quite honestly should have walked away with a weekend sweep, but I mean, what a, what a performance. I mean, if anyone gets an outstanding performance, it's just period of the week, it's going to Tyler Reddick in my opinion. Right. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move on to the upshift downshift question. Cause we're hemorrhaging time. Um, upshift means we agree. Downshift means we disagree. These are a series of hypothetical questions and or statements that we will be presented. I'm going to present them with Josh first, and then I'm going to give my view. I'm going to try and keep this more or less short because so we can move on to ro- rollers featured racetrack. But the first question here is Gene Haas's decision not to sponsor Roman Grosjean in IndyCar due to Haas's genes. 
uh, desire not to see Grosjean kill himself due to having a wife and three kids is a double standard because he supports two young unmarried drivers with no children. Do you upshift or downshift this, Josh? That's the first thing that came to my mind when I read this article. I upshift. I think it is a double standard. It's kind of... It's not setting a, a, a precedent, but it certainly is a mixed signal. If if I'm Mick Schumacher or if I'm Nikita Maspin, and I'm like, so is my life worth less because I'm not attached and I don't have kids? Well, I respect Gene's decision to, to maybe say, I'm not going to support your desire to do this. I think he kind of went around it the wrong way. And maybe this is one of those things we look back in history, probably shouldn't have gone public with it. I'm I'm upshifting with you as well. I think it's it's it was stupid of Gene because, you know, first of all, he's straight up saying you'll he, he thinks Grosjean will kill himself in IndyCar, which let's be honest with ourselves here. Grosjean's only running the road and street courses. They've got a, a I, I'm I'm a little bit more confident with IndyCar's ability to with IndyCar safety levels than I am with F1 safety levels. I think F1 has shown the last couple of years that they're still a little bit behind North North America when it comes to motorsport safety. And that's not something that maybe they want to hear, but just look at what has happened. Just look at what what why it takes drivers so much longer to get assistance It's at times. Um, Formula One is all about a quick show. So, you know, it's quickie yellows, quickie yellows, all that stuff. I just I just feel like it's a bit hypocritical, like you said, and it's it's just not wrong. I think he's going about it the wrong way. So, uh, I, and yeah, like I said, it, it, he's straight up telling his two drivers that their lives matter less somehow. And I think that's ridiculous because it, it, Mick Schumacher, you, you, Schumacher family can't afford any more loss. Let's be honest. So straight up right there i mean he's got a problem so all right um oh boy we get to talk about the burtons i love i was watching ward burton was on uh the scene vault podcast great great uh interview that ward burton has if you can understand him god bless ward burton uh again seriously the best guy in the world uh ward burton wildlife foundation they just opened uh what did they have the 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 helping house on the on his um on the on the pavilion for uh veterans uh wounded veterans uh, current and and non uh, excuse me uh active and uh, inactive veterans can come to that uh area and get a hot meal and hang out it's kind of like a, a VA but it, Ward Burton put on his uh uh on his wildlife uh concert conservation so it's really good for Ward Burton love Ward Burton everything he does for community but anyway his son his cool son jeb has quietly collected three top fives to start the 2021 nascar xfinity series season do you upshift or downshift that he will be the first colleague driver to reach victory lane this season oh i'm going to downshift i i think aj will get it to be honest with you um though haley has kind of impressed me too but you know what if if these races keep ending in crazy madness Jeb Burton is a smart race car driver, and he puts himself in good positions. He doesn't take that outlandish risk. He will do it, but I'm going to downshift. I'm going to say not all these races are going to end crazy. I I, I don't think he'll be the first one. I think he'll find victory lane. I just don't think he'll be the first one. You went crazy. Go watch uh, videos of Ward Burton grabbing snakes. I've watched him, dude. I love him. I always send him to my mom, my grandma, my dad, and their the responses are always the same. Ooh, yuck, and ah! <laughs> I think it's cool. I love Ward. I love Ward Burton should have a nature documentary. He should, I would watch that. He should. I would watch that. I would watch a Ward Burton nature documentary. But Jeb Burton, I am going to upshift. I'm going to say he's going to take I think so. I really think so. Jeb has a lot to prove, and I know AJ's been good, and I know Justin Haley's been good, but I think Jeb is the sleeping is sleep is just like a snake. He's sleeping in the in in, in a tall grass, and Love he's it. ready to strike when when you least expect it. So I like it. Thank you. Uh, here's about how about a question? I'm I'm interested to hear about this one. The NASCAR Cup Series allocates too many tires to teams per race. Do you upshift or downshift this, Josh? I upshift. There's way too many. There's certain tracks like Atlanta and Darlington. Yes, you need to give them maybe a few more, just so you 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 don't run the risk of 
too many tire failures. But on a race like Homestead, a one-lap shootout, let's take tires. Let's come back down at the end of the stage and take another set of tires. That should be a – you should be thinking, do I want to take tires now or do I want to take tires after the stage? Do I want to race for points or do I want to do I want to take a risk and kind of gamble off and save them or race hard? There's – the majority of NASCAR Cup races have too many tires allocated to teams. I upshift this one. It's an easy one for me. No, I would I would actually have to upshift that one too. I think you're right in that there's certain tracks that eat that literally eat tires. Um I think about it's not on the scheduling one, but I think about Rockingham. That place would literally yeah. shred tires. Uh and, and if you didn't have I mean you had to have multiple sets. You had to have as many sets as you could. Otherwise, good lord, I mean guys we're not gonna finish the race. We're gonna be like, All right, we're out of tires. Mm-hmm. We're out of tires. What do you mean we're out of tires? We're out of tires. But the driver didn't drive that hard. We know we're out of tires. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a driver drove half throttle the whole race. I, I don't know what to tell you. All of them are down to the cords. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think, uh, and even then, reducing the amount of tires allocated could probably help save the teams a little bit of money too. And exactly. make the competition a little bit better. So make create more parity. Clint Boyer was all over the uh, broadcast yesterday or two days ago on Sunday talking about parity, parity, parity. I really think the less tire, as, if you can get people having to conserve tires and decide when to take tires and when to take fuel. Only. Well, I think that'll make, yeah, I think you'll make parity a lot better and make the racing in general a lot better too. So I'm going to upshift on that one. Yeah. Um, final question here. Do you upshift or downshift a hypothetical triple header at Circuit of the Americas comprised of NASCAR, NTT IndyCar Series, and IMSA? I do. I upshift. I like it. Cause, <laughs> and here's why. Here's why I want to do yes, this. Tell me why. Because you can't put five races on in from five from three different disciplines on in one weekend. I just don't think it's possible. But I like this because I think it'd be cool to get all three. First off, all three together. I don't think this is something that Indianapolis is interested. I think Roger Penske and Penske Entertainment really want to have a twenty four hour sports car race. I think they really like the doubleheader with IndyCar and NASCAR at some form of capacity. And with the Xfinity Series, are always going to tag along with it, with the NASCAR Cup Series there. But this opens up the door for a possible new track rental, and maybe the Xfinity Series goes to Montreal and the Truck Series goes to Portland. Just saying. But I like. But I. But in general, I do like the idea of IMSA, IndyCar, the Cup Series all racing a circuit of the Americas in the same weekend. I think it'd be cool. I like your positivity. Um, <laughs> I'm going to upshift it just because I don't have any reason why I wouldn't like that. I don't see why it wouldn't work. NASCAR already controls, I mean, it, the Cup Series and then IMSA. Um, I don't see why Penske would say, yeah, no, I don't want to get on in this. As long as Circuit of the Americas will have them, I, I don't see why not. Um, it's crazy because they fought tooth and nail to get Circuit of the Americas on the schedule. And they had to almost make Eddie Gossage mad, and now all of a sudden it's off the schedule. They're going back to Texas and... I don't know. I just feel like they could go back to Circuit of the Americas and be fine. Um, so, okay, Josh, let's go ahead and jump into Rollers Featured Racetrack because we've gone way over time. Well, whatever. Uh, we're about like a minute, an hour 40. So if you've been listening this long, I think we you deserve a treat, uh, a history treat or history lesson. Josh, you're going to tell us all about a track I've never heard of at all, but I'm excited to hear about it from you, our history expert. Josh Roller, take it away with Rollers Featured Racetrack. Well, this one is a, is sort of just going to go over uh, a few moments from a track from days gone by. It's not going to be a full-blown history of, of everything, because probably because I couldn't find uh, trusted sources um, that uh, that I would that would want to use on this one. Um, but this track was and is uh, located in Spartanburg, South Carolina, a city for a while could have been considered the capital of NASCAR, as many teams were based out of the textile Carolinian town. As the 1970s drew closer, however, Charlotte became the base of operation for many NASCAR teams. Uh, today's featured racetrack uh, wouldn't see a Cup Series uh, racing into the 1970s, uh, but as it would close in the 1980s, the mid-1980s, I uh, announced the Piedmont Interstate Fairgrounds. Uh, during the first weekend that NASCAR Grand National Division visited PIF, Tim Flock had his head run over while napping in the infield on July 4th, 1953. What? Uh, af- after a flight from Rochester, New York, where he had raced the night before in for a Grand National race. 
Uh, he would be sidelined for a month before returning to Okanichi Speedway on August 9th. Uh, Lee Petty won the inaugural race at PIF with Buck Baker second, Herb Thomas third, Fonny Flock fourth, and uh, Johnny Patterson fifth. Unlike um, uh, uh, Flock, who raced the night before in Rochester, uh, Petty drove down. He didn't fly from Rochester, New York. He drove to Spartanburg, South Carolina, an over 800-mile journey. So those two definitely took different ways to get there. I thought those pretty crazy in itself that he made it uh tim flock would later win in 1955 at pif on march 4th 1961 cotton owens lapped the entire field after leading just 25 laps junior johnson led the first 102 laps before cotton's cotton owens led seven uh johnson reclaimed the lead on lap 110 a busted fuel line ended his day and owens took the lead on lap 183 uh the race was also notable for being the first career start of Wendell Scott. Unfortunately, Scott suffered from oil pressure issues and retired after 52 circuits completed. Uh, PIF would prove to be a good or bad day for Scott in nine starts. He scored three top fives and five top tens, but DNF'd in the remaining four races. Uh, yet he still had an average of 10.1 at, uh, at the track. On August 21st, 1962, Richard Petty won the 100-mile race at PIF. Uh, he, in his 62 Plymouth, and Joe we Weatherly in a 61 Pony Pontiac were the only two lead lap finishers that day. It was the seventh win and sixth consecutive victory for Petty Enterprises in uh, eight races. Jim Pascoe won at Bristol at, uh, on uh, July 29th. Weatherly won at Boyd Speedway in Georgia, breaking up the Petty streak. Uh, but six straight wins came at Nashville uh, with Pascal, Huntsville with Petty, Weaverville with Pascal, and Roanoke, Winston-Salem, and PIF with Petty. The following week, the streak came to an end. Um, on February 27th, 1965, two-time Grand National Champion Ned Jarrett put on an absolute smackdown against his 15 competitors in a 200-lap race. Jarrett led only 65 of the 200 laps, but won by an astounding 22 laps. Yes, second-place finisher G.C. Spencer finished 22 laps behind Jarrett. The way I understand it, there was a few retirements prior to that, um, and there was actually kind of a fear by like NASCAR and like the track operators that if – Jarrett had a failure, you know, he's going to be leading for so many circuits, even though he's out before it's overtaken. So you're basically adding 20 laps to the race at that point. Yeah, right? pretty much. But he won by 22 laps. I thought that was like, wow, that has to be, cr that, that was just absolutely crazy. In I'm my so mind. glad, you know, a lot of people talk about it, like, I miss the good old days in NASCAR. I'm glad I didn't live in the good old days in NASCAR where a guy could win by 22 laps. That's very true. That's very true. And if you talk about like the good old days, like eighties and nineties, maybe. But yeah, that's the good old days. Old. Nobody, nobody's going to convince me that uh, the first like six or seven years of NASCAR were the good old days. No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Some great racing, some great stories, but not parody for sure. No, no parody at all. <laughs> yeah. Jarrett would sweep at PIF in 1965 when he won the second race at Spartanburg on August 14th. This time, second place finisher Kelly Yarbrough was only two laps behind Jarrett. Wendell Scott finished fourth that day, 13 laps behind. Only seven of the 23 starters finished the race. Curtis Turner, driving for Petty Enterprises in the number 43, was not among the starters because he crashed in practice. Remember, the 1965 season was uh, the year that Chrysler pulled out after NAS uh, rule changes by NASCAR kind of benefited the Ford. So the we're pulling out. No, nope, we're not going to do it. And like Petty didn't did make that. Did you start. really say that the second place finisher finished only two laps down? Only two laps. Because remember, Jarrett lapped everyone by 22. You know, the, the only race. two laps. Only two laps. I just the, the, the use of the word only is what took me by right there. Well, after 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 I do the, the, the point before that, I know that's what's so crazy. It's like you go from, oh well, you know, at least he didn't win by twenty more laps like he could have. <laughs> yeah, he could have been could have been worse. Elmo Langley started five hundred and thirty five career NASCAR Cup Series races and only won twice. 
His first victory was uh, the final race at Piedmont Interstate Fairgrounds on June 4th, 1966. The field con- uh, did consist largely of lower-budgeted teams, but no matter, a win is a win, right? Uh, Tiny Lund led the first 160 laps, but his differential broke, and Langley took the lead on lap 161 and closed it out, leading the final 40. Neil Castles, Doug Cooper, Joel Davis, and J.D. McDuffie rounded out the top five. For Davis, it was his only career top five in the Cup Series. Ironically enough, Langley's second and final win came at Old Dominion Speedway later that season, which proved to be that track's final appearance on the Cup Series schedule as well. So if Langley won, your track may not be returning the next year. Was was kind of the, the story Quickly I got. Ban him from all tracks. <laughs> yeah, uh, people were getting worried uh, in 1967 at that point. Um, the NASCAR Cup Series race at PIF 22 times. Jarrett captured the leading six victories, including four of the final six. Richard and Lee Petty each scored three victories. Cotton Owens won twice. Buck Baker led all starters with 14 starts, but never found victory lane. The NASCAR Convertible Series race at PIF twice. Curtis Turner claimed both wins on September 29th, 1956, and May 25th, 1957. Uh, going back to 1939 real quick, Joe Littlejohn promoted races at Piedmont Interstate Fairgrounds from that uh, from 1939 until the day NASCAR, the NASCAR Grand National Division, the Cup Series, left in 1966. He was also among the attendees at the Streamline Hotel in December 1947 for the formation of NASCAR. Uh, so he was a fixture in NASCAR for almost 20 uh for 20 years um you know promoting races and being a big part of it uh on october 19th 2002 a legends race was held to raise money uh for a race museum at at at, at piedmont uh david pearson bud moore cotton owens rex white roger man mandeville dick brooks james hilton joe little john jr louis smith were among the attendees the Legends race uh, required actually bulldozers to make racing the racing surface raceable again. Um, unfortunately, the idea for the museum never became a reality, and the former racetrack is once again returning back to nature. Um, you know, it still exists, just not raceable anymore. Um, kind of like uh, Nazareth. Kind of like Nazareth. Very, very good comparison, except here, you know, you're talking about dirt uh, and not pavement. But uh, yeah, exactly like like Nazareth. It's, this might uh, be uh, unrelated, but did you see this week Joey Logano apparently has a project at North Wilkesboro? No. He posted something on social media where he was at North Wilkesboro, and he said he's got something going on. I don't know what it is, but okay. I, I was watching a documentary from Slap Shoes about North Wilkesboro, and... It really wouldn't, like, compared to doing another racetrack, it doable. If you got if you got the money, it would be doable to, like, fix it up. The, the, the biggest problem with North Wilkesboro, which I believe, I think, if you just look at the track, don't, the only thing you have to do is maybe repave, unfortunately, um, just because of the wear. It's been so long. You have to build new facilities, new stands. Yeah, of course. The biggest problem is the utilities and the surrounding infrastructure getting 45,000 people okay. to it to, okay. to a race, uh, you know, plumbing and sewage and all that. That's the yeah. biggest problem that, that, that North Wilkesboro faces. But if you right. have enough right. I just thought that was interesting. No, I just great. I, I, I'm going to have to see that. I'm, I'm interested to see what that project is. Oh, real quick, before, I, before we move on here, I just want to say racing reference, Silent Speedways of the Carolinas by Perry Allen Wood, History of America's, Speedways past and present, cottonowens.com in conjunction with nascar.com helped with today's rollers feature racetrack. Um, it sounds like I might have to do a North Wilkesboro part two, though, here coming up, maybe. Um, after what Joey Logano comes up here, though. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look might, into it. We'll look into we'll, it. We'll have a couple, I think we'll have a couple part twos this year because I've yeah. been promising those for a while. Rob, send us out. Yeah. Uh, what's on the windshield coming up this weekend and week? Uh, the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Actually, more, more this week, this month, I guess. Because it is March. We're doing the March edition. Uh, yeah. March Madness is uh, just a long way. And if you're a race fan, that means when all the racing series starts. That's mm-hmm. usually March. So yeah. that's our March Madness. Um, the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship is at Sebring. Uh, that'll be on March 20th. 
Formula One will return on March 28th. Uh, the same day as the Bristol Dirt Race. Okay, fun day. Um, yeah. Formula E takes o- over a month off, uh, but they will, will they probably need it after this weekend. Uh, but they will be back in uh, Rome in Italy on April 10th for the Rome E Prix. IndyCar C- Series will start its uh, season the following week. It's good Lord, it, on April 18th at Barber. It's too late. Too late in the season for IndyCar to be start, but I understand because it's COVID. But uh, this week we've got NASCAR, so... Good news. We got plenty of NASCAR to watch. We've got three races: Cup, uh, Xfinity, and Truck. Uh, X- C- Truck's going to be on Friday. Xfinity Series is going to be on Saturday. Cup Series on Sunday. Those will be in Sin City and Las Vegas. Uh, so big, big races there. So thank you all for listening to the Racing with Robin Roller podcast. Uh, we we are so thankful that you stuck around for this long. We know we go long, but uh, whatever. You guys like it, I hope. Um, so thank you again. Remember, uh, go ahead and uh, follow us on social media. We listed them out in the beginning of the show, uh, so you can go back and, and listen to the, the intro again and get our uh, social medias. But uh, Or you can just hear me now because I'll list them out. At rpeters33 is me, Rob. Um, Josh is at roller underscore zero one, and our show is at Robin Roller, so just as it sounds. Now you can go uh, to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and search Robin Roller, and you will find us there. Uh, anytime you want so we'll post uh, all of our podcasts on YouTube now and uh, do some throwbacks uh, of, of podcast casts will be going on YouTube uh, but in addition this podcast will always stay here and you can find us there so uh, thank you so much and uh, please don't forget to wear your mask because the pandemic is still ongoing so uh, make sure you're wearing your mask if you're going to any races this week definitely wear that mask because you'll be needing it um, so for Josh Roller, my name is Rob Peters. Thank you so much for listening today. And this was the Racing with Robin Roller podcast. Thank you very much and have a good week, everybody.